Hello. Hello? OK. All right, great. So um, I'm Julia Connect. I work at Adobe. You may have heard of a small software company. Um, I'm responsible for, uh, like, like I, I was introduced to the secure product lifecycle, as we call it as a, at Adobe, um, for all of the digital marketing products, which are probably a bit different than, than what most people think of as um, Adobe. So um, my talk is called Sassy SPLC because I thought that was an incredibly clever name, and also because uh, the digital marketing products that we deliver um, are all SaaS based and also the way that we scale our security team to kind of deal with um, over a thousand engineers um, is to operate as a service. So we're kind of security as a service, which is also um, SaaS. Okay, so quickly um, about Adobe. Right now we're operating as three different clouds. Uh, we've got Creative Cloud, Document Cloud, and Marketing Cloud, and I'm responsible for Marketing Cloud, which is um, a full third of the business, and as I mentioned, about a thousand engineers. Um, the um, most people, when they hear Adobe, think Flash or Photoshop or Acrobat or, or one of those common products. Um, but um, what I work on is none of those things. We also do marketing analytics, which is our business to business. So we embed JavaScript on people's pages and let them track your movements all over the web and. Um, so these are the, it's, it's almost entirely made up of acquisitions. Um, so here I've circled, this is our, this is a marketing slide that I stole and, and cannibalized into kind of showing you what I work on. Um, I've circled the acquisitions that are the, <coughs> excuse me, that, that make up the Adobe Marketing Cloud. Um, there are about 10 acquisitions here. There's actually more. Um, and I joined in 2011, so I've been with Adobe through um, several acquisitions um, and, and helped with um, onboarding from a security perspective here. What just happened? Okay. okay, so now we've taken those 10 acquisitions, which in themselves sometimes had, you know, sub acquisitions and tons of products and um, distilled it down into eight marketing cloud products. Um, and these are what I'm responsible for. Um, and so um, when I joined, I switched security teams a couple years ago and I joined the secure software engineering team and um, being, and my boss said, you're responsible for the SDLC now, you can roll that out. Um, and, and so my goal when I was rolling out the SPLC was to create an SPLC that could be used by all eight of these products and I guess eight in name only, right? Because there's all of this complexity underneath from, from them being acquisitions. Um, we have companies all over the world using different stacks in different languages. It's, it's um, not something that grew out of Adobe, but something that was um, made up of a bunch of acquisitions. So my um, problem statement here is, how do you take these 10 acquisitions um, from all over the world running their different stacks and uh, build common security practices. How do you take, um, how do we take a small security team, so we were four people at the time, and scale it across a thousand engineers um, and be responsible for um, making sure that our engineers were building secure or, or software using secure um, best practices. Um, and so here's a quick outline of, of how we did it at Adobe. Um, um, not going to go through them now because I will go through them in a second. But um, I wanted to kind of also give you guys an idea of what my mindset was when I started to roll this out. So um, another thing that I'm interested in, in addition to application security, is behavioral psychology. So why do people do things? Um, and I've read several behavioral psychology books. And I'm going to save you a bunch of money on all of those books and give you the quick secrets here. Um, so people will do things in general for one of two reasons, and the first reason is that you're paying them enough money to do it. It's a thing that um, you say, you know, I'll give you five bucks, go do this thing, and, and they'll do it for the money. Um, and then the other reason is because it's something that they want to do. It's something that they feel fulfilled by or they get some sort of personal value from. Um, and so... Um, this, the, the paying people to do things tends not to work, it tends to be inconsistent, um, and the behavior stops when the money stops, and it's, and it's not usually a good quality of work. Um, 
when people want to do something or when they feel like it is um, something that, that rewards them in a way that um, is not uh, external, someone's telling them to do it all the time. The work tends to be more consistent, it tends to be better, um, and uh, the quality of work is also better. So, so this, is what, um, this is what I kind of set out to do at Adobe, was to um, build a secure product lifecycle that was something that people wanted to do, that they could feel ownership of and they could feel proud of and, and feel like that would kind of continue the um, building of software using secure coding best practices rather than uh, forcing them to do it or paying them to do it, you know? Um, so, so <coughs> excuse me. Um, <coughs> so, um, our team tried to organize in such a way that we could uh, teach the engineering teams uh, about security as well as become a resource for them, um, and, but ultimately having them own their own security. So at Adobe, we try and have the product teams actually be the owners of security and we're a, a resource or a service for them. Um, and so um, security as a service. So this is one of my SAASs, my SASs. Um, so this is how we were able to scale our extremely small team at Adobe. Um, uh, and so I came up with this brilliant, I think, analogy for, for how our security team operates. Um, and that is um, that we operate kind of like the fellowship of the ring. Um, I was flying back to San Francisco from Hawaii. I was on vacation and um, was coming back into town and watching the um, Return of the King, which is a great movie. And um, it's around that time when I usually am watching like the trilogy, you kind of figure out that like Frodo gets all of the credit for doing the thing, but really the fellowship had like a huge part to do with it, but, but he kind of gets the recognition. Um, and, and maybe there's multiple heroes in the story, right? So um, that kind of helped me come up with the analogy here. So, so the first thing that I mentioned in my outline is um, getting buy-in from the product teams. So first off, we have the product engineering team in this analogy who is Frodo. Um, so Frodo or the product engineering team actually has to deliver the product or the ring into Mordor or the internet, right? So, um, so we are not, as, as the security team, we're not sitting there building code for the teams. We're not making the commits into the product. Um, what we're able to do is um, to, to be a resource for them, but, but it's got to be Frodo, it's got to be the product team uh, who delivers this. So um, I went to the engineering leadership. I met with each of the VPs when I was rolling out um, the, the SPLC, and I kind of scheduled uh, time with them, and I said, listen, here's a really important thing that we're doing at Adobe. We need to um, start having a more formal SPLC. Um, this is what I think the first iteration is going to look like. Um, and, and I went to them and kind of asked for support. And um, I, I worked with each of those directors to name a security champion. And I'm going to talk about the champs in a second. Um, but, but I had them name a security champion on their team um, who would work with me to continue to improve our approach to security for um, the solution. So ultimately, I needed the product leadership to say, I will take the ring though I do not know the way, right? Um, and so, so quickly, just one of the tactics that I was able to use to, to get product engineering team to buy in, is this something that you guys struggle with? Does product engineering ever give you a hard time? No, everyone's product teams love security. No. Um, so one of the things that we started doing at Adobe that was really helpful um, in getting buy-in was we started measuring the revenue that came from products and, and um, contracts where the customers had security questionnaires or they had security requirements um, before they would sign with Adobe. And so we were able to measure that. And it's not, it's not a small number. Um, more and more customers are starting to require it as, um, as a, a feature of software. So, um, so that was something that, that was really helpful with getting buy-in. So money, money usually helps. Um, so um, like I mentioned, I had the product engineering team leaderships join or, or um, 
excuse me, named security champions. And so when I went to the leadership teams and I said, I need a security champion for each of your teams, um, can you give me someone? Um, I kind of gave them a rough definition that um, for me was an advocate of uh, security and the digital marketing team's point of contact for uh, the solution. So I wanted the champion to be someone who um, had a good understanding of the technology um, and an interest in security or at least the security of their solution um, and also a strong personal network in the engineering organization. So these are a few of the champions. Um, this is not all of them. We have at least one per product. Um, getting closer to two, when I rolled it out, we just had one. Um, <coughs> but these security champions who were named by their um, um, bosses to come work with me on security actually ended up being team leads and architects in most cases, which was great because um, that, was, that was something where they already had the cloud on their team. And so we were able to kind of take this person and, and I think engineers can be your, your greatest opposition or, or your biggest advocate, right? So we wanted to take these people and make them our, big, our biggest advocates. Um, and so um, I, wanted, I wanted to just take a quick second and talk about how um, the security champions at Adobe have really, really pushed um, our, our uh, security program and, and been able to kind of move the SPLC. So I kind of think of them as like this human botnet that, that um, I get to reach out to, right? We've got one on each team, sometimes two on each team, but, but they're, kind of, they're able to be remote and to kind of operate and push security in their own little group and kind of get their own little culture of security going. So um, it's, it's something that's really interesting to me to see kind of how the different champions handle it. And um, one thing that we do at Adobe, I mentioned the product teams own their own security is we, we give the security champion a lot of authority and power in that, um, and, and we also give them a lot of training so that they can actually be an extension of the security team um, and, and kind of have the um, ability to um, speak about security and be the resident expert on their team. That's, that's not someone coming in from outside. It's someone who's already trusted and in their organization. Um, so just some, I guess, a fun story about security champs. Um, I had one security champion who um, started with without me ever asking him to. He just started sending like these security state of the union emails to his full team. So he would, after I would meet with him, he would um, write up like, um, you know, dear engineering team. Um, I, you know, these are the security projects we're working on. This is some of the stuff that's important. Um, here's how we're doing on our SPLC KPIs. And also here's something really interesting I learned about SQL injection the other day. And he would write these up and just send them out. Um, and I didn't even ask him to. I just kind of, I got CC'd on them like once or twice and, and it was fantastic. So the security champions really were, were able to be a force multiplier for me because I, I don't have the capacity to email 700 people. Um, but, but if if the champions are able to do it, then that's great. And, and one of the things I mentioned that they're kind of like this uh, um, network. Um, one of my security champions has established sub-champions. So that was another like without asking them to, they kind of took the culture and, and, um, and made a change. Um, and so he named champions on each of their scrum teams. So now there's, um, he works with me and then the, the sub-champions work with him to, um, to make sure that um, security issues are, are properly understood and vetted in scrum meetings. Um, and so something that we do as a security team to try to support um, the uh, champions in their efforts to um, um, expand security uh, culture is, is um, when they do something like this, we'll um, help them put together training or something. So, so something that we're doing for that team is we're having a security summit where three days we're gonna go and teach them about threat modeling have um, the, the security champion who works with me, he's gonna give a specialized training about um, uh, security best practices for this particular product in this particular language and, and in the way that they use it. And so it's, it's getting really, really specialized at this point. Um, and this is all made possible through this um, kind of uh, network of security champion people that um, we're able to have at Adobe. Um, <clears throat> so, First lesson learned, it's gotta be the product team. 
uh, get champions, and then wherever you can. I think that's something that was really important to uh, the success of our security champion program was having the engineering leadership teams name the champion. So it was a director that came down through their chain of command rather than the security team um, kind of going in and, and demanding it from them. Um, so back to the analogy. Um, Frodo mentioned that he's happy to take the ring, but he doesn't know the way. So the challenge here is that the teams don't know the way. Engineering teams, um, when you start out from scratch building a security program, they don't know security things, right? Like this is, um, there's not a super high level of understanding of security concepts when we started to roll this out. So um, at this point, we as a service organization get to say, um, no problem, we'll show you the way, let's show you the way with this map that's going to be a bunch of training. Um, so at Adobe, our security training program is, is in four parts. The first two parts are computer-based training, um, the white and green belt that are um, based off of the OWASP top 10 and um, their technical security training about uh, each of those common vulnerabilities and then some additional things as well. Um, brown and black belts is actually a really interesting program that we have as well where people can submit um, reports of security projects that they've worked on. So this is like above and beyond the usual projects that they're working on. Here are things that they're doing and they get, uh, you know, X number of points and then these points translate eventually into a belt and this is something that's hard to get and so it's really kind of like a high honor when, when people are able to achieve this um, belt stuff. So. Um, something else, when rolling out a um, SPLC program that uh, I noticed was that the very first KPI we focused on was this one, um, and that was kind of to establish a baseline with the teams of, um, of uh, vocabulary so that we could have a security conversation with them. Um, and um, <clears throat> so, so the first KPI was training, and this is something that's great as a first KPI because it's extremely easy to understand and there's not like caveats anywhere. You can't say like, well, they kind of did the training. They either did it or they didn't, right? So, so it's very easy to measure um, and there's no exception. So I hadn't even, so it's extremely easy for leadership to get behind this as the first like security push and then it's something that they can say, you know, we got this win because it's easy, easy to say this is, um, you know, 100% or whatever it is. So um, I hadn't realized how easy it was to get behind this until um, I was in our, one of our VP's monthly meetings and he started kind of going off about, you know, does everyone have their white and green belts yet? This is really important to Adobe and, and um, kind of made it something that was important to him because it was easy to understand, and easy to measure. Um, and so within six months of starting our security champion program, uh, seven of our nine teams had gone from like 30% um, being white and green belt certified to over 95%, which was really impressive because it does take a long time to actually get this stuff done. Um, so another quick fun tactic with SPLC that um, was something that worked. I, I took out the names of the products, but the letters represent products. And this is the actual data from right before we were trying to hit our 95% our KPI. We had two teams who had hit it, and I made this cheapo graph in Excel, and I sent it out to the security champions, and I said, hey guys, um, here's the, um, here's, here's kind of where everyone stands, and then those first two teams who had hit their 95%, I said, great job to these two teams, you guys did awesome, um, kind of heaped praises on them and said, like, you're making Adobe more secure, you're doing this great stuff for our customers. Um, and what I hadn't counted on that happened was that these teams, because I'd organized them in a way that they cared about right here with, with their different product engineering teams, they took this um, and they forwarded it out to their teams. And so the teams who had hit the goal were like forwarding it out and saying, we won. You know, it wasn't a competition, but they won because they got there first. Um, and, and they were um, really proud of that. And then the other teams, two days later, had also one, right? So this is our seven of nine teams having made it to 95% um, or greater. So um, lesson learned here is set a baseline, make it an easy KPI for your first people to achieve so that they get an um, easy win. Um, uh, so measuring and automating. Uh, so the next challenge that I have here for SPLC um, is that 
when we first started rolling this out at Adobe, um, people were not really held accountable for security in a way that was uh, actionable or measurable. There was kind of a gut feel about something that was bad or something that was worse, and, um, but, but there wasn't kind of a, sustain, a sustainable practice here. So um, as I mentioned, that, that first KPI is training. Um, this is a screenshot from a while ago, but, but these are the things that we kind of chose to measure as part of our SPLC um, and something that applied to all teams at once. Um, was training, security reviews, static analysis, pen tests, and dynamic analysis. So these are typical security practices, right? Um, and, and then another one that we've recently, or not, not so recently, but, but another one that we've added is um, time to resolution on security vulnerabilities. Um, <coughs> so, uh, um, yeah, so, so another point about these metrics is we made them point in time metrics to avoid any like wishy-washy, do we really feel like they're gonna change? Should we make them green or should we make them yellow kind of um, thing? And so <clears throat> here on these um, KPIs, we made sure to set them in such a way that, that um, they're easily automatable and measurable. So we had um, everything that we track as far as security program goes, all of that stuff is in JIRA. Um, or, or for training, it's actually in a, in a different system, but, but everything is where the engineers live in JIRA so that um, there's no like third party system that they have to go log in to see what their security work is um, because that's, that's silly. Um, and so um, this allowed us to automate and so this is constantly up to date so a team can always go see exactly where they stand um, on the secure product life cycle and if something is not green, then we've got pretty clear definitions of what it takes to be green um, in any one of these SPLC um, pieces. So um, another thing that's important with um, automation, another thing that we did is we're automating, so we're op in operating as a service, we need to have everything kind of be self-service to the teams, right? We can't go out to the teams and constantly be bugging them because that takes a lot of their time. So what we need to do is, is measure them in such a way that they come to us um, to say, you know, we need to improve our static analysis or we need to get set up on dynamic analysis or do a pen test or whatever it is um, that, that we have to have them do. Um, and um, so what we have is kind of a self-service portal where a team can come and say, you know, we want to do static analysis, we want to do it at this cadence or we want to do it um, at this build time or whatever it is. Um, and, and they can kind of request that. And so it is um, individualized to the different teams, but at the same time we're able to measure it in a way that's consistent across all teams. Um, so yeah, we have one engineer who's fully dedicated to helping us automate our security programs. Um, and that's, I think that's been one of our big um, steps towards being able to reach the thousand engineers that are in um, Adobe Digital Marketing. So um, another, um, <coughs> another lesson learned here, um, is that we uh, provide incentives and we recognize teams um, who are doing well. So, so the teams are individuals who are going above and beyond in, uh, in a way to make sure that their team is operating in a secure way. We, we send out um, recognition. Recognition kind of goes a long way. And, and I had someone, when I was building this program, one of our um, senior directors kind of uh, let me know. He said, um, listen, he who giveth kudos can also taketh away. And so that's something that I kind of, I took to heart. And so I'm, I'm very consistent in letting people know who's done well, um, because these kudos, you know, if they come out once a month or if they come out once a quarter, as long as it's consistent and people are looking for them and they know um, when to expect the, the pat on the back or the it, lack thereof that, that is taking it away, um, it, it, it's a good way to, um, incentivize engineers to do well. And so the way that we do this is kind of through their management chain. Again, this is something where we um, leverage the, the people's intrinsic motivation there to, to do well in their job um, and to be able to, to um, feel like they're adding value to Adobe. Um, so recognition goes a long way, but also swag goes a long way and trips to Black Hat DEF CON go a long way. Um, so it's not all recognition. There, there are other things um, and, and competition. So, yeah, so provide incentives, make sure that the incentives are properly um, reinforcing the right KPIs. All right, back to the metaphor. Um, 
So this is, this is uh, I, as you can see, I flipped the hobbit the other way. So this is Sam. Um, and so, so this is our program management team. And um, we, needed, we needed support from our supportive organization to be able to scale security in a way that, that was effective and that was able to be maintained over long term. So um, PGM is with the engineering team every step of the way. And they support the engineering team and uh, making sure that they stay on track and everything. Um, and so that is why program management gets to be Sam. Um, my favorite character, but it's not me. Um, so so when, when the teams say we're going to Mordor and they're going to deliver this um, securely written code, uh, Sam needs to go with them. So he needs to say he's coming as well. And so the way that we were able to leverage PGM at Adobe was we were, and you don't have to read all of this. It's kind of our diagram showing how we develop software at Adobe. Um, but all from the initiation and to the end game phase, this is this is a program that the program manager, the program managers own. So what I did um, was I met with program managers and program manager leadership, and I said, "Explain to me your program. How do you build software?" And then I took it and I said, "Let's put security in all of these different places." And um, what we were able to do was um, ensure that we had a clear process for adding security requirements to. Um, to projects and, and able to make sure that testing was done at the right phase in the release cycle and, and everything and, and able to measure this back in, in the SPLC KPIs. Um, and so this is something that I think has maybe been one of the most important things is leveraging existing process where we can. Um, so inserting those checklists and, and providing the um, documentation and information to allow the, um, I guess the, the knowledge, the security knowledge to be pushed outside of the security team and into PGM and into um, the uh, engineering organizations. So finally, this is, this is the last part of my analogy. This is the security team. We get to be the rest of the fellowship, and I couldn't find enough licensable images, so we just get this one for now. Um, but but um, in the first movie, when Frodo says, I'll go, though I do not know the way, and then Aragorn says, OK, well, if by my life or death I can protect you, I will. You have my sword. And then Legolas says, and my bow, and then my axe. And like they're all offering their sweet tools. Um, and so we get to do this for the engineering teams. We, as a service organization, we get to say, you have my um, training for modeling hacking skills, blah, 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 right? So we get to kind of say, um, rather than offering literal weapons, we get to offer our services and how we can help them out and how we can help them to achieve the goal, which is um, building software in a secure manner. Um, so, uh, so that's the end of my extended analogy about um, how to operate as a, a service organization. Um, but, but this is how we're able to be um, an effective partner to our um, teams rather than being some kind of um, overhead or some or someone who who kind of is, is not helpful we're able to be helpful to them so so these are some of the services that we offer obviously for your own SPLC you kind of get to decide um, but, but these are the things that we're able to offer our teams and and help them with so um, so yeah lesson learned is is for me to be a service organization um, help your engineering teams to take advantage of the security um, services by making them self-service and making them um, available to them. Um, so the next thing um, here is, is to continue to grow the culture of security that you're growing by making a secure product lifecycle and pushing it to the engineering teams and having everyone be individually responsible for the security of the product is to provide more opportunities for learning. You can't just stop after the green belt and say, OK, that's it. That's all you get. Um, so uh, the opportunities for learning that, that we offer um, is additional training. There's, we've done like hacker classes and, and different trainings along those lines. I think I've mentioned that, that we took our security champions to Black Hat. Um, and that was something that was great because they got to go hang out with the security team, get you know, properly terrified, and then they get to go back and be on their engineering teams um, and kind of bring that knowledge back to them. Um, another fun thing that. Uh, my team was able to, su to support and do was something that we called Hacker Village. Um, and Hacker Village, um, at Adobe, we have this huge internal security, or not security conference, I wish. 
it's just the regular conference. We have this huge internal engineering conference every two years where engineers from all over the world fly into um, usually the Bay Area and, and we'll go to the Moscone Center and talk about all of the cool projects that are going on within Adobe and that's a really big um, engineering culture event. And so two years ago, someone from my team um, came up with the idea for Hacker Village and so what we did was we set up these six booths um, outside of the tech fair like before when people were walking in and we had um, different, um, a, like it, at each of the booths there was a different um, security um, learning experience I guess or lab and we had like RFID hacking and SQL injection and cross-site scripting with beef and um, I think we had someone do like a drone hacking thing but, but he wasn't allowed to fly his drone inside the Moscone Center. Um, but, but a bunch of really cool different things and um, something that kind of surprised me about this was I reached out to the security champions who were already going to the conference and I said, hey guys, we need volunteers for this um, hacker village. Would any of you guys be interested? It's, I know, you know, like, and I, and I kind of wasn't expecting a huge response just because um, this, is the, this is like one opportunity every two years where everyone kind of comes together and is able to um, uh, spend time with each other, but to my surprise, every single one of the security champions was really excited to kind of help out with these booths. And so they were, um, it was it was cool because at that point we got to see kind of like the students who were our security champions become the teachers and they were able to teach the other engineers how to use the tools and they were kind of, they were uh, security lab assistants um, or, or assistants for, this, for the booths and we're doing it again uh, next year and a lot of them are actually leading booths next year, which is, which is really cool. Um, I think that's that kind of shows like how how the culture has been able to uh, permeate the engineering um, world. Um, and so, my um, final lesson learned here is to add value. So, as a security team, a lot of people think of you as overhead, right? Like you walk in and people are like, "Oh gosh, what do I have to do now?" Um, and so, so something that has been really important for us that w that's been able to help us build a great rapport with the engineering teams is, is to be able to give back to the teams in a way that's meaningful to them. Um, so we've operated in a way that's well organized, well organized um, and encourages teams to do the right thing, um, but we're not a drain on resources. So for example, um, our team gathers a bunch of information for the pen tests that we conduct. We do white box pen testing, so we get um, access to source code repos, we get kind of um, the high level threat model and, and they kind of, they spend a lot of time helping us get that information and so with the information that they're able to give us, we're actually able to give it back to different organizations who need that kind of same information without doing the gathering twice. So we help um, make that more, it, we put it in a more organized fashion and we give it back and we say here's, you know, the composition of, uh, you know, XYZ and, and um, other teams are able to use that. So we're able to, um, give back and then um, another thing that's that I kind of alluded to before is that we have security conversations with customers on behalf of our team. So our teams give us time when they sit down and threat model with us and then because they've sat down and threat modeled with us we can create security documentation for them um, and we can also take that information and we're able to have that conversation with a customer and we're able to make that uh, information accessible to a customer and so they're able to continue to um, build software. Um, so that's, um, that's something that, that we think of as super important at Adobe is making sure that, that we're not just taking, that we're also um, giving back. Um, so the results from rolling out the SPLC, we, met, we hit most of our KPIs within the first six months. Um, we've got a really active and engaged security champion at work um, and, and people feel like security is part of the job description of being an engineer at Adobe. Um, and, and so we've got champions actively working on projects and establishing their own sub-champion groups and um, helping make security awareness more than a compliance checkbox. Um, so quick summary of the lesson learned here. Um, get champions, establish a baseline with training, uh, leverage the existing process, uh, measure, automate, uh, recognize, and give back. Um, and so that's the SPLC for Adobe Digital Marketing. And if you have any questions about security or anything, 
um, from, I guess, an Adobe point of view. Here's our resources slide, and um, thanks. Okay, so the question was, um, for, the, for the training belts, once you achieve a color, do you degrade over time or do you maintain the color forever? Um, the white belt will expire after a year, the green belt doesn't expire, and black and brown belts also don't expire. So if you do the higher level of training, that's actually another one of our incentives, right? If you get the green belt, you don't have to do it again. Um, but, yeah, an another thing that, that um, I think helps with security is, is those trainings are like two to eight hours for getting your white belt and then your green belt. And so a lot of engineers, I don't think, have the time to do that again and again. Um, and so we're, um, we build like wikis and stuff where they can go refresh their memory without having to do eight hours of training again. No. Maybe. We are an analytics company, we probably could. <laughs> but, um, yep, I, for now we don't have that requirement. There is, there's different compliance training that we do on a, diff a, a different security awareness training that is on an annual basis, but the um, hardcore technical training is not um, refreshed as often. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the question. Okay, so the question is, do we use vSIM or OpenSAM to, or any open source framework to, um, to analyze where we are as far as a maturity model perspective, um, and and so the answer to that is is not at the moment. We don't do that. We um, are still operating within our, I guess, proprietary SDLC and getting teams um, onto that. Um, we haven't done that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you guys handle globalization? Uh, so uh, the question is, how do I handle globalization and having distributed teams all over the world? Um, and that's a good question because we do have teams all over the world. When I first started rolling out the SPLC, I actually went and visited them. Um, each, you know, and said, here's the SPLC, you're the security champion, make sure that's important to you. So the answer to that is late night phone calls, um, early morning phone calls. Um, I visit on occasion, we do in-person things and we try and make sure that they do get um, special attention to make sure that they know that they're part of the Adobe family. Um, but, but that's something that we do with, I think, uh, just continuing and having a constant conversation. So I talk to the security champions every other week. Um, and that's something that's that's actually pretty frequent. And um, and the security champion who's actually building his own like sub champion group is is out of the country. And so I think um, that encouraging them to do that kind of thing and building their own security culture in place and having them be the authority and and kind of the security expert in that area um, has has helped with. Uh, making them all feel included. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so the question is, is I guess ratio and numbers of, of people on the security team versus the engineering team. So um, we had four people on the security team, on the digital marketing security team when we started rolling this out. We're now up to eight people. Um, and then there's a central security team of like 30 people. So um, there's, there's three of those people who are security researchers who were able to tag in um, to help with threat modeling and things like that. So eight plus three, so about 11 people on the dedicated to digital marketing security team. Um, and then there are over a thousand engineers in the digital marketing um, business unit. So a lot. <laughs> Not a lot? Yeah. Um, 
Um, so I, I can't think of something that just, oh, sorry, sorry. So the question is, um, is there anything that we tried that didn't work? And then as a follow-up, um, is there, what are we working on now? Um, and so um, I don't think that there's anything that like fell on its face, failed. Um, but, but we have gotten feedback from the teams on how to improve. So I don't know if you can maybe take that as, as something we didn't do well um, because we're, we're getting, um, this feedback from the teams of here's what we would like to see or here's what would be more helpful. Um, and so something that we're working on um, doing now is, is um, making more specialized training for the security champions, helping them to become um, more, I guess, internally certified as, as uh, security like threat modeling um, and helping them to, to create um, kind of resource pages very specific to to their own infrastructure and things like that that um, I think are more targeted. Um, because I think once, once they've gotten past the initial green and white belt training, they want more. Um, and so we're actually, um, in exchange for brown and black belt points, actually having them help us build more so that, that we're able to have more for the Adobe employees. Okay, yeah, the question is how do we measure brown and black belt points? Um, and the answer to that is it's a, it's like a number of hours spent on a project with a multiplier based on um, the impact of the project. So if you're working on a project that can help all of the teams at Adobe, that's gonna be a higher impact multiplier. Um, and then also, um, I think, yeah, and, and if you're working on like, if you take a security course, that's only, oh, sorry that's only helping you, that's gonna be a multiplier of one, right? So um, that's how we measure the points. So it's, it's, it's an hourly thing and, um, and it's 1,000 points for a black belt and then 3,000 points, or sorry, 1,000 points for a brown belt, 3,000 points for a black belt. So it does take a while to get one and so they are pretty rare, um, which is pretty cool because then you get to be kind of part of the elite club of brown and black belts. Um, so the question is, are all of our security champions black belts? And no, they're not. We've got several who are security that are black belts, but some who have not, um, haven't submitted points or, or they just haven't gotten their, their number yet. We do have several brown belts and, and a lot of them are working on it and are on their way. Um, but to do a thousand hours outside of your regular job is a lot. And so, yeah. Thanks.